Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for being here with us today. I'm Laura Jege, a course lead here at MIT CDL for the MITx MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management. I'm very happy to be co-hosting this live event again once more uh, with Mr. Kellen Betts here, also a course lead at the MicroMasters program. Today, we are very, very fortunate to have Mr. Alessandro Silvestro joining us today. He's a director of Industry 4.0 and Sustainability Strategist at Cognizant Technology Solutions. Welcome, Alessandro. Thanks for having me. Hi, Laura. Very, very happy to have you here today. Thank you. Um, so before going to the agenda for this session, I will ask our team members, Lisa here today and Emma with us, uh, to launch our first poll for the live audience. We want to learn, as usual on our events, why are you here today? What do you want to learn? So if you check the poll, there are some options there. Are you here for the digital technology portion, for the lean strategies, for the um, learning how to improve the supply chain? Or are you just here because you'd never miss any of the MicroMasters live events? <laughs> um, so I'm giving the floor to Mr. Kellen now. Awesome. Thank you, Lara. Hello, everyone. So for the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to discuss the complex trade-offs we see in supply chain management. Definitely a fascinating field and lots of complex trade-offs. So we're going to discuss the tools and the awareness that we need to strive towards that lean, green, and digital supply chain. On the last 15 minutes, we'll definitely save for your questions, so start thinking of those. And please use that webinar Q&A feature so we can um, keep track of those questions and bring them to Alessandro. I'd um, love to see introductions and in, in discussion in the chat, and please use that Q&A feature for your questions. And also be sure you're logged in with a name. We won't be drawing any questions from anonymous users. Awesome. And we'll have a few more polls throughout the event, so keep an eye out for those. We'd love to see your in input and feedback in those polls. Maybe we'll just check on the results of those first polls here. You can end that poll and see the results. So the question, why are you here today? Um, lots of lots of options, you know, to learn about digital supply chain technologies is looks like a popular one. That's great to see. To know more about optimizing supply chains using technology. So definitely a technology focus, I think, here with our audience. I don't know, Alessandro, if you have any thoughts on those poll results. Yeah, absolutely. So those are very interesting topics. And I'm, um, I'll put more accent as we speak uh, into the maybe top two or three um, answers that have been selected. Awesome. With that, are you ready to get things started, Alessandro? Get things off? Yes. Awesome. So, um, yeah, maybe just, if you could just share a little bit about your background and what brought you here today and a little bit about your story, if you could, please. Yeah, absolutely. So, again, thanks for having me. Um, Laura already told you um, I'm um, Principal Director for the uh, Industry for the Dow and Sustainability Strategy at County Center Technology Solutions, and I have about 15 years of working experience. Um, I graduated as an industrial engineer from Milan, come originally from Italy, live now in Cologne, and uh, worked in the past 15 years in manufacturing, operations, supply chain, uh, industrial internal things, what we call in Europe Industry for the Dow, and now sustainability. Um, as to give an example of the industries I've been working um, on, it's automotive, consumer goods, eating systems, package gases. Um, I've been building, you know, greenfields and expanding brownfields in Eastern Europe, um, doing strategic performance roadmaps and um, transformational programs all around Europe and sometimes also around the globe. And today in my position, I basically help clients in their uh, digitally enabled sustainability journey, which means achieving uh, people, planet, profit goals all at the same time in different ways that you can, um, that, that, that you can achieve them. And we'll talk about that later. Awesome. And, I... and, and, and almost forgot, I'm also, I, had, I was an MIT X student, so, and then I had the opportunity to pursue the, um, the supply chain uh, management uh, blended master program uh, at MIT in 2020. Almost forgot the most important thing. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. We're very happy to have you as a credential holder here, but you're bringing a lot of information from the industry, a variety uh, coming from your experience. But I'm sure we're going to connect with all the topics that we we'll learn across the courses, but also with a lot of important matters that are happening right now out there in the supply chain world. Um, so just going straight to it, I would say like you're bringing to our table this on, on the um, title that we put for uh, our live event today, a lot of concepts like lean, green, and digital supply chains, but they, those are basically buzzwords that we hear and read about everywhere. 
and that we all want to work for whenever we are in the industry. We, we really want to be part of that. And when we get hands-on and we have to be a part of the implementation, we know there are several constraints we may face. So aspects we can think of as resource availability and allocation of resources, company goals, of course, priorities, market expectations, and many more could affect the decisions and forces going in different directions, sometimes one opposite to the other. So based on your experience, how do you face the decision on where to begin? What's the sequence in which you would ex implement those goals? And what would be your advice uh, for someone that's in the same journey? Yeah, the, thank you. That's a great um, question. It goes right into the core of uh, the three words that we chose as buzzwords for <laughs> this event today. Um, um, I'm, I learned a lot of tools during the MATX program and also a lot of tools during my career. I'm going to share just one slide with you and walk you through um, the dimensions that I have in my mind and different approaches on how to um, um, let's say holistically have a look at how, what are the company pain points and how to address solutions. Um, let me see if the sharing screen is working. Perfect. Can you, can you see my screen? Okay, so this is loosely adapted from, and it's also one of my favorite slides about um, uh, uh, the baseline of the cash flow model. And it's loosely adapted from the MAT, uh, MATX uh, supply chain course. And um, when you, you know, are, let's assume you are um, in a company that wants from you to improve their operations, then it doesn't really matter whether you report into the senior management or you are in the middle management uh, or you are just a supply chain practitioner. Now you start thinking about the tools that you gather from your experience and your studies. And I highlighted a couple of those, um, thinking about the end-to-end -end production. Let's assume it's a manufacturing company. So you have raw materials, the manufacturing, the distribution, and the customer delivery. And you may have um, some lean approaches. So lean manufacturing, for those of you who don't know, um, is um, um, a methodology and a philosophy that, that focuses on reducing waste all along the value chain. And, and the supply chain approaches that you might, way, might very well know are the ones that you also learned from, through the MicroMaster. So you have different approaches in orange and, 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 and purple. And now that's the, what I call the lean or supply chain part. You want to maybe increase your inventory turns, uh, have higher on-time delivery so that you can capture uh, not only customer satisfaction, but also uh, new markets. Um, but uh, internally in your manufacturing, you, you, you may want to change your machinery, the tools in such a way that um, you have a lower inventory, so you want to um, accelerate the cycle times. And then back to your um, inbound warehouse, again, you want maybe to lower your inventory targets, lower your transit times, collaborate with your suppliers. So you have a whole bunch of tools. And now if you think about the dimensions and the digital and green part, well, the digital part is there's a lot of solutions out there that cover end-to-end -end those uh, processes. So if, Left to right, you have supplier management systems, and that's where you uh, focus on your how what you spend for the supplier and what's the volume you are insourcing. And then you have manufacturing execution system for the production uh, material flow and the track and trace within a, uh, within a fact manufacturing plant. And then you have the warehouse and um, um, inventory management system to for the finished goods to be uh, organized. And then you have the distribution and outbound logistics uh, that reaches the client. And then the CRM, um, customer relationship management, order management. So that's the digital part. And this is an additional dimension that allows you to simplify and automate workflows that are behind the tools that you learn. And then you have the sustainability dimension. How do I account for the CO2 that is emitted during this um, uh, in the upstream supply chain? Do I have the opportunity to collaborate with supplier for near shoring um, of some standard components so that the components, they don't have to travel so much around the globe and thus emitting more CO2? Or can I um, handle my manufacturing process in such a way that I save energy while standing by and waiting for parts? Or can I optimize the routing of the uh, of the goods to the clients so having CO2 emissions in mind? Uh, 
Um, and all circular economy principles, principles like refurbish, reuse, repair, recycle. Um, can I have more durable products? So you have all this bunch of tools and all those ways to think strategically, holistically on how to address those issues. But when you enter in a company, remember we said at the beginning you would work it with uh, for the senior management. They don't really understand most likely the supply chain and the manu and the value chain the way you do. So the first thing you need to under the, you need to make your priority their priority. And one way out of the book would be okay. I take my approaches. I kind of rank them according to the benefit they could bring and according to the effort they would cost me in the organization to implement them. And it's a good approach and it's a good start, but it's most likely not enough because as you go along with um, you know, uh, asking for the resources, asking for commitment, trying to get the right level of sponsorship, you will find resistance and you will have a lot of change management going on. And that's where you need to kind of dynamically adjust your um, targets, having a, a, a holistic global um, roadmap in mind for those goals, whether it's productivity or lead time or on time delivery. Use the tools that uh, we discussed so far and many others that are available. And at the end of the day, making sure that the company understands what you want to achieve so that top down you have the right sponsorship and bottom up, people understand where you want to go one step at a time. Laura, I hope I didn't take too much time. I mean, I could talk already about this slide forever. Awesome, no, thank you, Alessandro. I really love the visual. Um, definitely highlights, you know, on the one hand, you know, the simplicity of supply chain, maybe, you know, at least the chain concept of, you know, from raw material to delivery, but then also just the complexity and the manifold opportunities there are for supply chain professionals to engage in those different processes and, and look for opportunities to achieve or work towards that goal of lean, green and digital. I'm wondering if maybe we can just kind of pick up on one of those threads you mentioned there. Um, I know many maybe on their, are on their journey, their digital transformation journey. I know it's been a focus for a lot in the last few years with all the disruptions, you know, gaining better visibility, for example. And obviously in our first poll, it was a definitely an interest for our audience. And so I'm wondering if you can maybe expand on that digital um, dimension, if you will, the digital or the technology dimension and how it fits into this, this puzzle. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one recurring um, topic that I have discussing with executives uh, either earlier today is that there's no one size fits all solutions. You need to think about your IT tool set. And more, sometimes people want to buy a Ferrari or a Porsche for their organization in terms of digitalization tool, but it doesn't mean that that's the right approach. Sometimes you want to um, try fast and fail cheap so that at the end of the day, when you have the right tool set in the uh, source made delivery processes, then you can expand your MVP into a full, uh, you know, a, a full blown solution, building small white houses as you go along. So that kind of provides the positive culture enforcement. What doesn't work is trying to take just, and that's my opinion, of course, but that's what I see in the history, the industry is trying to take one tool and try to fit it and customize it for everything. So you will uh, you will end up having maybe 50% of the functionalities out of the box and a lot of customization and probably a multi-year development, maybe five, seven years. And by the time you are finished, then the, te the technology is obsolete. So you need nowadays that the agility that is required to implement the IT tool set um, is more about um, uh, small use cases that you can scale up fairly quickly with a very strong return on investment. Thank you for sharing those. And thank you for, well, you, you brought this, like the availability of tools that is out there and what is possible to um, implement in a certain time that makes it timely and helpful at the same time. Um, so we were thinking, and also when we discussed before um, joining uh, today, that one of the key constraints that they have a uh, supply chain manager in, in general business management would be budget. And budget does also include not only the number, but also uh, time frame to develop something, to develop this project or to move forward with an implementation, whether it's of the digital tools or any of the others that you mentioned to um, go in this kind of uh, lean and green and digital projects. So um, when we manage decision making, we need to analyze costs at a more granular um, level. 
And it's not always easy to identify costs to make sure that we're within that budget and within that time frame. So um, can we expand a little bit on how you identify true costs versus perceived costs and how you roll out those decisions and this information to executive decisions? Okay, that's uh, almost a three, four part question. So I'll tie it up with the previous one and then expand upon it. Um, the, and also give you a bit of my experience. So fairly, um, fairly easy, let's make, let's say either you work among the audience, either you work in a company that is bigger than 10,000 people or lower than 10,000 people, then chances are, if you are joining a supply chain position or a lean improvement position, performance management position, combined with the ability to implement digital tools, it, it's either top down, so a corporate mandate that tells you you need to do X, Y, Z, and you have a budget allocated and, and resources, and all you get to do, in, it's complicated enough, but all you get to do is structure your sequence of actions and define my, milestones and a rollout plan. I was more often than not in cases in which um, um, there, the senior management understands there's a need for operational improvement, but they don't really understand what it is. And you are now hired in, a, let's call it in a mid-sized company under 10,000 people. And you need to figure out how to start. What is the right sequence of tools and approaches with no budget? So you, you, at some point, three, six months in, you will feel like, I need to save the world of this company on pennies. And by the way, uh, by the way I needed to do it yesterday. Um, it's very hard when you don't have reason. And, and I'm taking the on purpose, the worst case scenario, because that's the one that I, <laughs> that I had most of the time. It's uh, using what you have. Um, sometimes you find um, islands or pockets in the company of excellence. Um, you, you don't have to come up with new solutions right away. If you have a network of 20 or 10 uh, production plants, you will always find somebody that has already tried um, an innovative low-code platform for manufacturing execution system or a, an innovative supply chain practitioner for scenario planning and, and um, um, sales and operational planning. And then you start to understand, okay, how do I, under, what is the maturity of those plans? And now what, what does it take from the, spot, from, from the senior management to invest in the first use cases, having a very fast return on investment on those, and then scale up. Chances are, to answer your questions, especially nowadays, when I started my career 15 years ago, it was acceptable to have a return on investment of five years. Nowadays, most of people, most of companies, even the big ones that I mentioned before, they want either 18 months and some of them want to have 100 days. It means that you want to have a use case with a um, operational uh, transformation and IT a transformation and even sustainability on top of it in 100 days. And it's super challenging because the companies are already operating under maximum. And um, long story short, there's no, again, one size fits all. You need to understand your baseline. What, what it, what's, right, what's going well, what's not going well? What kind of multidimensional tool I need to pick from my supply chain lanes and to, um, sustainability toolbox and digital toolbox. And then as you go along, if you don't have the right budget and you don't have the right resources, try to uh, build um, with little money those use cases. And I never forgot, I know the question is long, so I haven't forgot about uh, the, the true cost versus the perceived cost. Um, if you are in a sales-driven organization, most of the time the CEO and the CXOs in general, they will, they will look at the profit and loss or the balance sheet, and they will determine uh, that they need to increase some revenue and decrease cost of goods. Well, not even cost of goods sold. Let's call them operating expenses. And if they are in a hurry because they need to meet quarterly results, most likely they will cut um, with a myopic view, meaning they will try to source uh, a lower material with a lower quality, but it's maybe 30% cheaper. 
or maybe they will bring some people slowly to retirement because they are no longer needed. And when it, most of the time, in both ways, just to take the two examples, you will lose in quality or you will lose in experience in your, in your, uh, in your company. So what, there's a lot of educational meetings, but don't call them like that with your senior management, but there's a lot of educational meetings that you need to do to tell them, hey, the cost of goods sold, so work in progress plus the cost of manufacturing, you need to break it down into material and energy and labor, for example. And now you start thinking, what can I improve with the resources that I have using principles that we said before and also train the trainer, change management so that maybe you are not meeting the next quarter, but you're getting extremely good results by the end of the year. And um, another you know, dimension in which uh, I often found myself confronted with um, senior management is um, we don't have we don't have budget, the cost of goods sold uh, is already high enough. So how about um, transferring them production somewhere else or transferring capability somewhere else? Uh, that's easier said than done. It's not just because you find a spot in a low cost country that the, the capabilities were unpacked. There's a, an ecosystem of suppliers, of universities, the need to collaborate um, and the need to be f the, as an input to this factory somewhere in, around the world. So more often than not, it's a complex discussion, a lot of educational thoughts, and uh, um, again, no one size fits all solution. Awesome, thank you, Alessandro. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, definitely one thing, maybe one point you made that really stands out to me and kind of highlights the complexity of some of these trade-offs is that you know, quarterly or like, you know, shorter term, if you will, um, vision versus a little bit longer term vision and maybe sacrificing a quarter or just having a quarter where you're investing versus, you know, improving the year's results or the, you know, five-year results or whatever happens to be. And just then that trade-off right there, just with the time versus the budget um, and that balance it really highlights, I think, a, an area of, of complexity for sure. Awesome. So maybe I want to shift gears a tiny bit and, and pick up on one point that you made earlier, like one example, so we can maybe kind of dive deep into one example. Um, I think you mentioned this earlier, and we discussed this earlier as well, just on nearshoring. I know this is kind of a, a strategy that you see nearshoring, um, you know, onshoring, if you will, to a certain degree here in the U.S. at least, and nearshoring. It's kind of a strategy you see, you see a lot in the supply chain media, at least, um, I know a lot of companies may be rethinking about this, and maybe if you could just expand on this concept and some of the impacts this might have within this lean, green, and digital ecosystem, um, especially maybe some of those technology impacts. And I think we all maybe think about the, the network and maybe the, the shorter distances and so maybe the reduction in CO2, but we don't always think about the technology impacts of something like a nearshoring strategy. Yeah, absolutely, Cotton. Um, It's one of my favorite topics right now because... Um, also in the course, and uh, you've seen the Black Swan um, theory or the Black Swan principle. Now we talk about gray swans. We, are, we had Corona or COVID crisis. We had the microchip shortage crisis. Um, the Suez Canal was closed a couple of years back for, for some weeks. So there's normally a Black Swan is what? Every 10, 10 years, maybe every 20 years, but now every three, two years, there's a new um, low probability occurrence of a bigger impact crisis. And nearshoring kind of solves the problem of resiliency on the supply chain, but also the sustainability one, and also the cost one, and also the digital one. Let me explain. So from a sustainability perspective, if I, let's say, based in Europe as of today, and I was to source um, uh, a component, the starting come from, from Eastern Asia, um, yeah, sure, I can do that. But if it's a standard component and not a mission critical component, why not doing the same with a little bit more cost perhaps in, um, from Eastern Europe or from Southern Europe? If it's a standard component, it should be available, right? Well, you, now you, you imagine you're having this discussion with senior management there, you will say, yeah, okay, I need to pay 20 cents more per piece. Now you say, okay, but you have more working capital available because the lead time is not six weeks from Eastern Asia, it's now a couple of days. So you have more cash to spend in other projects, your projects hopefully, <laughs> that you will finance later on. And from the sustainability side, you are 
all things, uh, all, everything else equal, you are drastically reducing the CO2 impact. Um, from a digital perspective, um, it's also, kind, I know everybody thinks we are all connected, but systems across continents sometimes do not com, um, you know, communicate well. And there's also um, the opportunity to use the same platform or the say cloud provider and also cultural fit and time zone. Now you work with people that maybe understand you, uh, your requirements faster just because you work in the same region. It would be the case uh, in Asia for Asia and it's Europe for Europe, America for America and uh, the time zone, right? So they, you can react faster. So a lot, I love the near sharing example because on the green, lean and the digital, they kind of you know, miss them all, right? So. Um, Love the, the did you ask that question? Thank you, thank you for bringing that. And I appreciate how everything come back to the trade-offs and the implications of one decision on the other, the way that everything at the very end connects and how we need to consider all aspects. It's not like we're only doing near sharing for a certain matters, but as you said, we have to meet all together, analyze the impact on all the columns we have in any cause we're analyzing or in any type of uh, or, or piece of our company, um, just to have a full understanding of an, an overview of the supply chain impact and the final decision and implementation of this kind of project. Um, so connected to that, and you brought optimization in terms of cost, the uh, inclusion of sustainability, but you mentioned a lot of times during our conversation today, the word lean. Um, so I was thinking that whenever we focus on cost or just sustainability, we, we miss the big picture. And uh, we sometimes have to answer different internal and external st stakeholders. And we, we have uh, business implications of our decisions that we may be helping in some other ways that we're missing. So um, based on your knowledge on lean operations and the lean philosophy overall, would you share with the audience the impact that we have as supply chainer? Like, set as a, the supply chain person now and think on how can we as supply chain help on a lean uh, philosophy environment and what, what would be the benefits uh, that this would bring not only to the supply chain team, but also to the company? So um, now I, I mentioned before what lean is, um, well, lean manufacturing, lean management, and now lean in terms of being agile, uh, expands upon it. Um, we, I personally geek out on mixed, mixed integer linear programming is something that I love learning during the MITx. Um, but it's just one tool. And if I want to model everything on my own, maybe I will I'll solve one specific problem. I am definitely not agile. I'm definitely not effective in, in a sense of a company. Um, so I go back to the fact that being lean and being agile means you most likely know the tools at your disposal. You most likely know where you want to end, where you want to go. What is your future state in some years from now? It, the hardest thing is the first step. Where do you start? And the second hardest thing once you start is how do I keep it dynamic? How do I because the senior management will come back at you or the company will come back at you uh, with different demands. Uh, almost on a weekly basis, if not on a monthly basis, uh, because the industry pressure is different, because the requirements are different, because the client wants something else. So being agile, being lean means understanding that it's not you against your own company trying to implement all the wonderful tools that nobody understands but you. <laughs> it's not about that. It's about um, adjusting yourself and understanding that you need to embrace the moving target philosophy. I know, I, I know that it, it's, it sounds contradictory at first, but you really need to understand that um, the people that are running the company face this every day. So if you commit to improve the service level for your client, you need to commit to those and then you need to commit also on improve the profitability and sometimes both they don't really match together. 
uh, how you do that. You need to keep balancing and juggling multiple bo- uh, multiple balls, and you need also to understand for yourself how many can you ha- how many moving parts can you handle, how many projects can you start. So the concept of lean and agility is empower the moving target um, uh, scenario in which you find yourself in, uh, especially if you're you know you are growing a position of middle management and having to take care between senior management and shop floor uh, requirements and um, adjust your tactic and your strategy with, with, with the time. You keep in mind your goals, maybe you, you change a bit their weights, but uh, you always adjust um, and to your stakeholders. Awesome, thank you, Alessandro. I think the, if anything, these last few years, some of these disruptions have taught us is that moving target is definitely a, a, a true true reality for, for everyone, and especially in supply chains, but I know in a lot of other areas as well. And sometimes those those moves of the target, if you will, are fairly large. And so we got to move you know, in fairly large ways pretty quickly. So awesome. So thank you. So I just want to do a quick reminder to everyone in our audience there, that if you could use that Q&A feature to bring your questions. For Alessandro, we're going to um, work, get to the audience questions here shortly. And so we just have maybe have one more question for you before we get to the audience. Um, audience Q&A. And so if you could, you can use that Q&A feature to bring your questions there and we'll um, start to pick from those shortly. But maybe just kind of one last question, if you will, um, Alessandro, you know, some of our participants are in our MicroMasters program. You know, hello, I know we saw some in that first poll who are here just because they don't miss our live events. That's awesome. Um, but maybe they're starting their career, they're perhaps in a transition, you know, that's why they're in our program. And um, this may seem like a daunting, you know, next step or a daunting transition for them. I'm wondering if you maybe if you just kind of have any general advice for our MicroMasters learners and where they should start or where they should build on their experience here in this MicroMasters program. Oh, yeah, <laughs> great question. Um, I can tell you by my own experience. Um, I love supply chain. It's probably, to me, the broadest um, discipline out there in terms of um, like, you know what you can do in a company, everything that you can move in a company. But uh, apart from my first role in my career, re- I never really had the 100% supply chain role. I use a lot of supply chain principles um, and, uh, and, and I'm enthusiastic about the, the MITx program. I love the experience at MIT um, as a graduate. Um, but you don't have to be, and I was also convinced prior to maybe a couple of years, not so far away, not so long ago, I was convinced that I needed to have a 100% pure supply chain role. Uh, but it's not the case. You can use supply chain principles almost in any position. Uh, maybe not R&D, maybe not sales, but everything in between, source, make, deliver, you can use them um, to your advantage. And my my recommendation would be to uh, not necessarily look for that particular role, like, okay, I love uh, whatever network optimization or I love procurement collaboration. Uh, there's also other roles out there that will fulfill you with maybe sustainability and uh, digitalization components and where you can use those principles and, uh, um, and always think strategic about not the next, where you want to go and think backwards in your career. Like if tomorrow this is my role and I, I wanna be there in maybe 10 or 15 years, what do I have to do? It's, it's better to understand where you, what is your next role if you, if you have your end in mind. That's what I would feel like recommending today. Thanks, Alessandro. Thank you for sharing your insights. And as you say, like supply chain brings you a lot of tools that you can operate. And uh, and also I think like it, it gives you a common language that goes right through the company in all fields. And it, it and, and as we talk, their impact on, on internal and stakeholder uh, internal and external stakeholders is huge. Um, so having the possibility of getting this knowledge and applying it for different areas and fields of expertise, it's great. Um, so we have a question. The first one from the audience that I want to bring here is from Nikhil Shankar. Who, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that well. Um, so this is about the sustainability part. And he's saying with scope one and two, it is usually easier to have more control within a company's supply chain 
What is your opinion dealing with scope three targets with so many associated risks, crisis, and variability with suppliers? Um, so the standard agreement among professionals is that, as you rightly mentioned, um, scope three is uh, not under direct responsibility of the company. But if you're a product company, there are ways to minimize your scope free. Um, one is the product itself. So if my product is not too complex, let's think about uh, batteries. It's a great example. Uh, light uh, lithium ion batteries are um, transitioning us into a, let's call it a more sustainable world. But if you think of down the mine, uh, cobalt, lithium are very, um, it's uh, the process of getting those rare minerals is very polluting. Now there's uh, some development in terms of uh, molten salt batteries that uh, have a slightly lower energy efficiency, but the salt is like 12,000 uh, more times available in, in, on, the, on the crust of the earth. So that's one thing, think about down to the mine, um, what is that my product requires uh, in terms of the emissions uh, that generates in the scope free? Another way of answering the same question is, let's assume you have a supplier portal that for standard components allows you instead of sourcing on uh, spent volume, it allows you to kind of perform a multi-objective linear optimization between uh, emitted CO2 or estimated according to the averages and the volume and the spend. That there's also a way to implement your insourcing from a sustainability perspective by just, well, there are platforms out there that do exactly this kind of job. So uh, there, there are many ways to reduce scope free um, emissions. Awesome, thank you. I know um, that you, know, you mentioned your interest in um, mixed integer linear programming. You know, that sounds like a fascinating area to dive into. I'm sure we could probably dive into that extensively in terms of just incorporating um, you know, sustainability or something like CO2 reduction, for example, as one of the objectives or as a constraint within those problems. But I want to maybe bring back here you know, some of our um, audience Q&A questions. Again, please use that Q&A feature. Uh, but maybe before that, should we launch our second poll here just to, um, if we could launch that second poll. We I'd like to get your feedback on what you thought was the most interesting part of today's session. There we go. So it's just some of the options. You know, what was the most interesting part of today's session is the question, maybe expanding my knowledge in supply chain management more generally. I'm learning about specific digital technology applications. And so um, if you could just um, give your feedback there in that poll. And then while we do that, I'll pull here a question. Looks like from McDonald here in our question in our um, Q and A, and he's interested, or maybe has experience in developing countries. And I'm wondering if you, Alessandro, have any experience in developing countries as well, and how uh, maybe that dimension or that um, context um, has any impact on this digital um, lean and green um, balance of trade offs that we strive for. Do you have any experience in developing countries, or any any ideas there? No, not directly. Um, I. In, in in every position I was, I, I always tried to think down to the mind, as I said before, so that whatever I do doesn't indirectly cause an arm uh, back in the upstream of the supply chain. I haven't worked. I, I didn't. I didn't have the chance to work personally in developed countries, um, but uh, I, I I like to um, to like, elaborate on a, on the concept of ESG. So when we talk sustainability, we have the ESG framework, environmental, social, and governance. And many times we focus on the environmental side, but the social and governance part is kind of forgotten. And the social part is about enabling the local people to um, have fair work, working conditions, you know, basic human right um, um, development, and also the G, the governance is about having partnerships with uh, governments or, or with universities to foster a culture of um, education and progress uh, because with more education, there's less um, um, disequalities, let's call them this way. So um, it's um, something that many companies out there try to accomplish and maybe also link back to the question about where, what should I do with, or where should I work in, with a supply chain, MITx credential. Um, maybe I also have a look at the ESG report of the company you're working, you, you want to apply for. 
Thanks, Alessandro, um, for bringing also the social sustainability to the equation. Uh, so as you say, sometimes we think a lot or hear a lot about environmental sustainability. But of course, when we're talking about developing country, in, in general about different regions of the world, the focus in sustainability may be switching to one or the other depending on their main needs or resources. Um, so thank you for bringing that. And I want to bring here a question that it's more from the managerial perspective, let's say, but I know you have a lot of experience there too. Um, so Evan is asking, how did you manage or how do you manage in general stakeholders to change mindsets and ways of working? And what was the most difficult challenge? How, how did you get that buy-in of your projects when you need a, a mindset change? Um, yeah, I think there's a good proverb saying, um, tell me and I'll forget, show me I might remember, let me do it together and uh, I'll be with you, something like that. Um, you, you need to, in your mind, there's a kind of norm, uh, bell curve. You, in the organization, you have people that are 60% undecided. They, they don't know whether they want to embrace your project or program, whatever you want to do. And then you have the people against it, maybe 10% and the people for it, 30%. Um, depending on the management layer you have on top of you, if it's just three people, well, it's not really a bell curve. So if you're lucky, they're all for you. If you're not lucky, they're all against. But the, somebody hired you, at the, so my, you might have one sponsor or two against them. So let's take that constellation. Um, in that case, you need to work um, to um, in with a bottom-up approach because obviously the corporate mandate doesn't work. You have maybe a CEO a CEO and a, CS, uh, a chief sales officer, um, so maybe three or four of them, and you need to show them that what your direct, let's call it chief operating officer, chief supply chain officer, what your direct boss wants you to do is not only the best for him, but also the best for the others. So and that's where supply chain helps you because as, as we said before, it's a huge discipline. You can connect operations to finance fairly quickly and finance and compliance are the two keywords to get to the uh, CEO mind because uh, compliance because of sustainability and finance because of results. Uh, those are the two keywords you wanna use whenever you want to get their attention. So now as you go along, you start bottom up, you, you pick your use case wisely um, and you develop them to show returns uh, and to show their scalability potential across your uh, production network or supply chain. And then at some point, trust me, those guys, they will also support you and they will also ask you, why are you done already? Well, what do you, they will understand the need for what you are trying to convey, but they will not understand yet why it takes so long. And, that, and that's why it's even more important to take them with, uh, in your journey, because if you don't show them, they don't understand what's like to go to the shop floor and change people culture with new technology, new methodologies, new systems. So take them when you can, when it's the right time, of course, it's uh, people's business. So you need to understand if you have, um, let's say somebody who is not necessarily friendly as a top manager in front of you, you need to you know, have this kind of uh, feeling, but take them with you in your journey and try to be political when it's when it's needed, but also effective when it's needed. That's what I recommend. Awesome, thank you, Alessandro. Speaking the language of the of the CEO, I think it's a it's a key skill set for us to learn, and I know we try to share some of those experiences here as well, for sure. And some of those you know terms and concepts are definitely. Um, core to our program as well. So I'm going to pull in me one more question here um, before we discuss our poll. Um, one more question here from the Q&A. This one is from Nilsson. Um, and his question, I'm going to kind of interpret it a little bit, but his question, you know, I know challenges across industries, and we've, we've spoken about a lot of different challenges today, but his question is like, what has made one of the biggest challenges that you've encountered that companies face um, with sustainability and where maybe some of those lean and sustainability trade-offs are compromised? Uh, maybe I know that can vary by industry, it can vary by, you know, region of the world, but maybe one of the biggest challenges you've encountered um, to sustainability. Well, I think it's fair to say that for many companies, it, whether they are product or service companies, these years is transition year. So um, there's a lot of cuts on budgets um, and 
unless compliance, which means law regulation, doesn't dictate that you need to do something. And here in Germany, we have the Supply Chain Due Diligence Act, which requires uh, uh, companies to provide evidence of their upstream supply chain um, compliance to human rights, so tier one, tier two, and so forth, every year. Um, so unless you have a compliance-driven process, it's very hard to spend money on sustainability. Uh, that's what I feel um, it's occurring more often than not. But on the other hand, um, if you're able to connect, similar to operations and finance, if you're able to connect sustainability with a financial gain, then chances are your project will be approved. And um, if you think about removing waste from a lean perspective, it's also more sustainable. If you if you reduce scrap, if you reuse material, if you refurbish, if you recycle, you are more efficient and therefore more sustainable. So now you can try to uh, get the buy-in from senior management for projects that are not maybe 100% sustainability related, but they do both. They uh, trade off between uh, operational efficiency, sustainability, and maybe why not so digitalization. So um, if you try to really fight your organization for pure sustainability project, maybe this is not the right year. It will be, it will be hard. But if you combine it with some financial background as to why to do it, uh, chances are they, they will listen. Thanks for bringing all the finance conversation here, because sometimes as supply chainers, we struggle to understand the connection with finance and the importance it has. Um, so thank you for that. I want to bring another question from the audience before we close it, because we have some uh, some more coming. Uh, but this one is from Hassan. In I actually was thinking like you have a lot of experience in big companies and we're talking about conversation with executives and how to get the buy in the bottom up. Um, but then there are also people here and joining us that come from small scale, scale businesses, that they work with small scale businesses, and they are sometimes facing additional challenges to reduce costs because of the lower, smaller scale they work with. Um, so they are uh, asking about how can we implement lean, green, and digital here? Should we focus on lean? Where is this uh, low hanging fruit when we want to go there in a small scale business? just to try to achieve some of those goals. So, and I, I'll, I don't wanna give you a one size fits all answer, <laughs> but I've been myself in, in small, medium and large companies. So one thing that I notice more often than not in uh, let's say companies under 10,000 or 5,000 people is that there's still a lot of room for op operational improvement. And now think about building a business case. Um, you, you want to put many items in your business case so that at the end of the day, the entire calculation looks solid. You have IRR or internal rate of return of 50% and payback time in three years. You wanna, you wanna have all of that net present value maybe of a couple of millions, but you need to, the right sequence is to solve first the company's pain points. So. If you have a bottleneck in your factory, which is driving the pace down of the entire production line, solve that. And then after you do that, you can move into the uh, digital, like, okay, now I have a well-functioning process. Why don't we digitalize it? And like, we can try to extra, to, to, to extract two, 3% more efficiency. It's like a Pareto approach. At some point you will achieve, you know, the um, um, what's the maximum possible with the re little resources that you have in a small business. And if you want to go to the next Pareto curve, you will have to hire. But by the time you have built a solid use case and a first um, uh, business case around it, uh, hopefully you will have also sold to your, to, to your management, the, the, those good results. So long story short, it, anywhere in the source make delivery process, you will find opportunity for streamlining the supplier base, 
um, improving the manufacturing processes, or maybe why not complexity reduction, one of my favorite topics like SQ pruning, SQ simplification. Um, are you in a consumer goods company, you have 900 products and 20%, uh, 80% of your revenues come from 20% of your SQs, just kill the rest. Why do you, so uh, if you use, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of stuff you can do with almost no budget at all, just, and that's where you need to start. Awesome. Thank you, Alessandra. I love the, the concept of, you know, there being manifold opportunity, even if there's not a budget for it, you know, and even for smaller companies or maybe regions of the world where the, the resources aren't there, there's still a lot, a lot of opportunity for supply chain professionals to get in there and improve processes and, and achieve some of these results and work towards that lean, green and digital supply chain. Um, awesome. So in the interest of time, I'm going to maybe share our results and look at that last poll here if we can. Um, the question was just what, what was the most interesting part of today's um, session for you? Um, some of the options, you know, expanding my knowledge in supply chain management. Um, it looks like the majority or, or um, the most popular one was just getting an overview of the impact of supply chain decisions on different areas of, of the company. I think that was definitely, a, I think, a key message that there's just so many complex trade-offs. And so sometimes instead of going for that Ferrari, you got to start, start small and maybe more incrementally work your way towards some of those bigger goals. Um, I don't know, Alessandra, if you have any thoughts um, you want to share well, on that. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, interesting to see that uh, everything is more or less there, right? Okay, we have a couple of 40, 46%, but most of the topics are equally represented, which means um, hopefully we kind of answered 360 degrees of what the audience expected us today to do. So um, I, I love the complex trade-offs we discuss and, um, and sometimes it's, a, of course, uh, a lot of headache, uh, but once you find, you know, the right sequence on every, everything that you have at your disposal, uh, it's a pleasure to see it, um, it being implemented. Awesome. Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's totally fine. Thank you for that. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll start wrapping up this event. Uh, so thank you for a very insightful conversation and be, bringing all these complex situations to the table and just sharing how to actually go there and have that conversation that's not usually the easy one to have. Uh, we're getting a lot of uh, great emojis coming up on thank the screen. You guys. <laughs> Uh, the audience is grateful okay. with you. Do so I have you. A, a bottom for 200 hearts? And <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's accurate. It's coming. Uh, so thank you to everyone in the audience. Remember that SE0X and SE2X enrollment and verification is closing tomorrow. So I'll make sure to get uh, verified with us to continue with the program. And uh, Alexander, any final words to the audience? Again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and I, I, then maybe next time we'll have the opportunity to um, talk one on one. I don't like being a monologue sometimes, but I hope you you could gather some interesting insights. And it's been super fun with you guys to be here today. Thank you. It's it's never a monologue. We loved learning from you today. And thank you, Kellen, for joining us today again. I love hosting with you. Yeah, thank you, Alessandro, and always a pleasure to co-host with you, Laura. Awesome. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, and see you. Uh, stay tuned for the next webinar in the series. This is the first out of three, so stay tuned. Okay, see you. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye, everyone.